You're listening to another episode of Battles with Bits of Rubber. <laughs> There you are. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Your video is a bit blocky though. Am I looking as sun-kissed as I feel? Because everything is, is a little tender. I did a lot of mowing today. Yeah, you um... look like you've gotten some, <laughs> some sun. You don't look English anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I look like a, a boiled lobster, which is my way. Yeah, so are you teaching today or are you finishing today? or you're not No, I'm... I'm uh not teaching on on uh, today or tomorrow uh, just monday through friday but i am here at school working on a, a couple of other projects um i'm i'm molding the the shrek ears that i had 3d printed i brought them up with me so okay. i'm kind of doing a a mold making demo on how to properly mold these things so that i can run foam in them mm-hmm. and because yeah, a two-part mold, just a front and back, would wind up with nasty undercuts and they'd never get it apart. So I'm going to have a piece that covers the inner ear part and then two pieces for the, the shaft of the ear. Nice. And I'm, I'm doing those up, finishing those up today because I got them started yesterday and I want to have them ready to show on, on Monday when everybody comes in, ready to hit the ground running on their final projects. Yeah, man. Two weeks from yesterday is their final application. So whereabouts are you? Remind me again. I am in a suburb of Portland, Oregon, known as Lake Oswego. Very cool. And how's the weather there? It's gorgeous. It's 65 outside, sunny. It's very nice. There we go. So you've had a busy week. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, and two more to go. Um, It's, you know, I love, I love teaching. It's great fun. It can be a bit exhausting. Takes a lot out of you. You know, it, it takes a lot out of you. Uh, I know, I mean, I've been doing nearly 12 hour days and I can honestly say I am tired, but I am more tired after eight hours of teaching. Because mm-hmm. if I'm doing my thing, I'm only, there may be lots of things I've got to worry about, but I'm only worried about what I'm doing in them. Whereas when you're in a class, obviously you have to divide your attention among all the things that could go wrong that, you know, you don't, it's not your makeup, but you don't want them to have, you know, an irreparable issue. So you, you kind of- yeah vicariously with them and And i've I've got a great bunch of students they're doing some fun things i've even been posting some images of some of the stuff they've been doing the last uh last two weeks on instagram Mm -hmm. Uh, they're having a lot of fun and rob berman yeah what a what a mensch he is he gave he sent me a a huge box of of foam latex pieces um you know that are seconds that you know he can't sell uh on the rubber website because they've got you know minor flaws in them you know stuff that most people wouldn't even notice but rob being rob uh, wants everything to be perfect so he's sent us this hundreds of pieces you know five you know foam latex is real light this box weighs probably six pounds or weighed six pounds and so we've been playing uh the last all this week with foam pieces letting the students just pick and grab and create characters out of this menagerie of, of pieces so they can get practice blending edges and painting the foam so that they're not doing the learning how to do that and figuring this stuff out on their final projects. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's been, it's been fantastic. That's really good. Yeah. I saw some pictures you posted of various bits and bobs and um, it's really good. Like you say, to, to, to kind of burn through all the silly mistakes that you would do on Mm -hmm. your final piece so that you you know you're a bit match fit for it and you know what those things are so their finals are going to be amazing yes i can imagine what you know it's it's that it's that uh it's that that running through stuff you know that um is is such an important thing like doing it more than once and getting out of your system the silly things you go oh now i know to look out for this that the other right um someone sent me um uh yesterday some pictures of a makeup just wanted you know some appraisal on it this sort of thing happens a lot. I'm sure you get that all the time as well. And it's one of those things where I have to kind of, I have to look at the pictures and I, I don't always get back to them straight away because I have to kind of let it sit with me for a while. And mm-hmm. it's, an, it's easy to ask, but it's not easy to answer because I can't be flippant or, or 
thoughtless with what I'm trying to say. Do you know what I mean? So it takes me a while to think. Yeah, no, that happens. I, I get uh, get requests like that uh, fairly frequently also. And, you know, you want to give them an honest assessment, but you don't want to rain on their parade either. No. Well, someone will say, oh, can you just have a quick look at that? And I'm like, yeah, but the thing is, it can't be a quick look because I know I'm going to have to sit and think about it for 20 minutes, half an hour. And then I might even, even not get back to you that same day because I need to just sit on it and it'll, I'll, I'll be clear about what I think later. I can't necessarily tell you the thing that pops into my head straight away because I need to kind of bounce it off of various things. And um, yeah, what you've done was a really nice makeup. Um, and I could see things obviously that needed to be, well, I, I figured needed to be changed, but it was weird. It's one of those things where it's like, I, I know that this makeup that you've done is probably like the, you know, you, it was your final project. You spent all this time preparing the pieces and making the molds or worrying about every, you're there, every, you know, inch of it. And then, you know, you come to apply it. And by the time you've, you've actually stuck it on, you're kind of spent. <laughs> there's not mm -hmm. a lot of you left to make creative artistic decisions because you're just trying to not fuck it up do you know what i mean so you're trying to get the edges right, right. you try to get the pieces in the right place you, you don't want air bubbles and you just don't want the base tone to be wrong and once you and you're even trying that, to anticipate a little bit what what is my teacher going to think about this so you're yes you're yes. trying to second guess something that while on the one hand i i totally understand it but you also have to just let the creative your own creative process go mm. and follow through from what you don't try to change what you had had originally set out to do midstream because you wind up shooting yourself in the foot yeah, uh, yeah more yeah, often than not of course. but yeah it was, it was interesting because yeah it was one of those things where it was it was it was technically competently done i could see that she obviously studied and worked hard to get good edges and you know, the, the fact the stuff was overlapping and the color base tone was spot on and, you know, it was, it was good, but there was, there were things in it that are sort of missing. And I'm like, so I just wanted to preface it with, look, I know, you know, just, I want you to know that everything I'm seeing is technically proficient. You know, you've done all of the right things, but it's just, it's kind of like you, you've spelled the words correctly, but your handwriting's not particularly perfect do you know what i mean so it's yeah. kind of like it's yeah. mean because you've only if you've only just learned the alphabet your your writing isn't going to be at its neatest but at this stage the fact that the alphabet's right and your sentence formation is perfect you can work on your handwriting do you know what i mean you mm -hmm. want to work on your handwriting before you've got the nuts and bolts of it down so it was kind of like that and it was just like it was nice to see but it was kind of like look i i reckon that you know by the time you did this you know you 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 it was it was competently done, but I could see things that needed like it needed eyebrows and you know various and and, and that, that that classic thing with appliances where it, it's not dark enough around the eyes. It's very hard. I mean, you look at my face, you know, there's, there's little mm -hmm. dark spots and blotches and stuff in here. I mean, a lot of that's just you know sun and being 48, but it's just the, the, the real skin typically does have those things in it, and it's quite. Are you saying that my face you know, has has more of that? <laughs> Yours is flawless, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at this low resolution, jumpy fucking moving bag of Lego bricks. That yeah. is the image that I'm looking at. But, but those so. are the things that that come with practice and experience. The more you well, do that's it, what I the, wanted the better, to get the better you're going to get. Yeah, that's what I want to get across because it's one of those things that it would be mean for me to point those things out. But it's also a, quite a compliment, I think, because the fact that those are really the only things that I'm worried about is, well, you just need to do this another 50 times. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. kind of like you, you kind of pass the point of, of, of initial criticism really. And I think that's the thing with a lot of makeup training is it'll get you to a point, but then you must, must, must do it again because it needs to be just part of your thinking so that when you come to do your next makeup, you know, it's, it doesn't take so much out of you when you apply it. There's a lot of you left to make creative decisions. You're not exhausted, you know? So. Yeah. Well, I, I try to make a, a concerted effort when I'm being critical of someone's work and th that they've asked for an honest opinion about it, mm. that when I'm showing them or telling them about all of the things that I see that are wrong or what I consider wrong, I make sure that I also let them know all of the things that they've done right that look good mm -hmm. so that it's there's a balance between positive and negative um reinforcement so that they don't yeah. go away going oh my god i oh, suck this is wrong <laughs> because <laughs> no, you, exactly. you're going to think that anyway you know we, yeah we, and, we never think our work's good enough 
No, and it's a weird one because whenever you know anybody asks me to look at their stuff, I, I I get a horrible cringing fear because I don't feel qualified to do so myself because I think every time I stick a makeup on, I'm hoping it's not going to fuck up and it doesn't look fucking appalling. And then when somebody, especially when a peer, you know, will see it like at a trade show, you know, you look up and you know you see Richard Redlison looking at you or something you go oh, jesus christ you know what i mean so so every, every worst thing yeah. that goes through your head is like oh i hope he doesn't think i'm an idiot doing this terrible makeup so I, I i know that feeling well so part of me feels like a complete charlatan when someone says can you look at this work because what i'm trying to do is i'm looking at it as if it was my makeup and i think what you know what is it what is it that it needs and I'm hoping that the things I point out are not just opinions that you could say, well, maybe it doesn't need to be that. It's things like that edge. Is that edge invisible? Yes or no. It's, it's, it's an empirical yes or no. There's no, do you know what I mean? You don't want, you don't want to come with fluffy stuff. That's just a matter of opinion. It should be, is that color the same? Yes or no. Can you see that? Does that look like a real chin to you? Yes or no. And once you kind of lock onto those things then it becomes less about my opinion being right and you're wrong it's a case of of just saying look i think this would look better if would you agree and then you and, and you know i'm the same when people point things out to me i'm like yeah and you feel it as much as anything you go yeah yeah you're right you know what i mean it's one of the it's one of the joys of looking at really good sculpture you know when you look at something like sebastian lockman's done or you know oh, yeah no, you could be you, you could be staring it, right at you know, staring right at a, at a flaw and because you're so close to it because you've been working on it for so long that it just escapes you and somebody goes you know what if if this this wrinkle here came down a little bit further and joined with with this crease you know oh yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, i don't know i don't know why i didn't see that before yeah i and that and that fear of, uh, of 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 that thing escaping your observation and or your ability to fix it never goes away <laughs> so i'm with you every step of the way with that one i'm like yeah i think this 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 and this but you know what well done seriously because i look at my first pieces and jesus christ um you know the quality of what people do as a first makeup nowadays is, is quite amazing because there's so much information available and that's the other thing it's like you know it's it's you, you've probably seen it where you can kind of spot maybe where somebody's trained or who taught them based on what they've done and how they've done it and then if their, yeah. if their knowledge stops at what they were taught and they haven't taken what they've learned and synthesized it into their own process and it becomes you know the starting point of something rather than just the end point because otherwise you end up with 10 makeups that kind of look the same yeah oh this kind of this looks really good but it could be better todd must have been your teacher <laughs> <laughs> well no but what i mean is what you don't want is a world where everyone gets to the similar standard and then just stops and then you've got sure. 50 people all doing about the same kind of stuff Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, it's very hard to pick now. Who do you, we're just going to go with the cheapest of those. I mean, you, you, you know, you don't want that to be your, your unique selling point. You want to, you want to push, push, push. And, and most people do, you know, most people do keep pushing. And I know that's the thing. I mean, the thing I'm on at the moment, I'm, 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 I'm nothing but surrounded with people who are better than me, you know, and I don't, I don't for a second. Well, that you can't get, that. you can't help but get better <laughs> in, in a situation well, that's like the that. Thing. If you, if you spot that, you know, if you can spot, things that are better then at least to some degree you have good taste to, to know when something is better you know yeah well if you're playing tennis with with somebody who won Wimbledon last year you're going to get trounced but you're going to pick up things as well so that the next time you play anybody you're going to be playing a little bit beyond where you were the last time you stepped on the court true enough and that's just so, it's, it's saying over and over and over again again it's you know the nature of being an artist uh, our work's never good enough and it's always about pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone until we get comfortable with what we're doing yeah and then we step outside that boundary again to be uncomfortable that's the only yeah, way you get any better it's a question of degrees isn't it because you don't want to be so uncomfortable that it repels you and you don't ever want to do it again right so um, it's got to be satisfying enough to, to, to be pleasing that, it, you know, you get some pleasure out of the act of doing it because, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's got to well, be it's supposed to be fun. It is. Yeah. But, it, but it won't be, it won't be, it won't be perfect. And, and no, and it, and it's not fun if you beat yourself up time yeah. after time, after time, yeah. just know that it's going to get better the more you do it and don't dwell on, 
the fact that it's not the way you want it to be right now. Yeah. And I'll tell That's you something okay. else as well that um, is, is that when you're getting paid to do it, nobody's more clear about what they don't like about what you've done than people who are paying you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a good thing to get used to in a way, because if, if, if you're, if you, if you offer yourself up as a working professional, then you are, um, you know, you're at the mercy of, of, of somebody who, who maybe even doesn't know how you do what you do. They just don't like it. And they'll say, yeah, something. they're, and they're entitled to, to let you know how they feel about it. Absolutely. But your, it's your their dime. Come into it because they're paying for it. So, right. You know. Conversely, when you're a student, that's the time to, to really push those boundaries and make mistakes. Mm. Oh, Donna says, hello. Donna. <laughs> <laughs> like clockwork. Because, like clockwork, she's actually doing a gig up in Keystone in the mountains today. So she's checking in, probably just saying she arrived. They're okay. And hi, Stuart. Oh, she's done with the gig already. Far out. Oh, cool. So she's going to do it all again tomorrow. For those that don't know, that is <laughs> Todd's wife's message tone. <laughs> and it happens either she messages you, message you a lot or it just. It's uh, invariably like when, we, when, <laughs> when, we, when we are recording. Speaking of which, this is kind of a milestone podcast for us. 75. Number 75. Three quarters holy, of the time. That's pretty good. Holy shit. It's only taken us about eight years to get here. <laughs> Congratulations, Stuart. Congratulations, Todd. Yeah. Um, it's 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 kind of cool. Yeah. Um yeah, so we've got uh we've got that. That, that, that all of this is this is just a by the by, this is just chatting. Um uh this is and what we wanted to talk about really uh i had an idea to talk about um specifically flat molds and cutting edges mm -hmm. and something so that, that we've been doing here at school for the oh, that's past cool. week yeah um and i've actually done because obviously a lot of this is um uh, that was me just moving my mic it sounded i don't know if you can hear that hear that <laughs> i did um uh the uh, 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 uh I, I did a video uh, covering these points that we'll discuss because it's much easier to see these things. I mean, this is the limitation of, of audio is that, um, you know, you, you can't see it. And often we will do, you know, extensive blog posts and stuff, but uh, sometimes a video is the best way of doing it. So there's a video to go with this. Uh, the video is called Flat Molds and Cutting Edges. It's on YouTube. I'll put the link to it in the show notes for this episode. Um, but yeah. So you've been doing that. Mm -hmm. Yep, we've been doing... <laughs> We've been doing stone flat molds and and silicone flat molds. Very cool. Um, so with your stone flat molds, what are you using to scrape out of curiosity? Um, I actually been using the same same uh, metal tool that I use for my 3D transfers and the silicone molds. Oh, nice. If I can find where it is, I'm reaching behind the microphone here for, into my kit. It's around here somewhere. Totally I've got some disorganized uh, today. I got some flat molds I need to do for a show. Um, I'm going to sculpt them again digitally and print them because. Oh yeah. Speaking of nice. speaking of that, I've I printed some. Uh, I didn't bring them up with me, um, but I had sculpted some stuff in ZBrush and printed them uh, with my AnyCubic, with my Mono X. Mm -hmm. uh, they turned out, they look great. The, the molds look fantastic. I know you had uh, some issues with the resolution. Uh, did you manage to fix that? I've got uh, to your exposure times. Um, yeah, I, I dicked around with, with that and I'm getting more detail in the prints now. Um, I've kind of angled it when I printed it at, at your suggestion and that, that did, uh, did quite a bit. Now I'm just trying to figure out how to, treat the resin prints so I can make master silicone molds without in inhibition. That's, well, that's been the biggest problem for me. The, one, the way I did it was I sprayed it lightly with a couple of coats of car lacquer, clear lacquer. Yeah. And then I let them dry. Uh, and I left them in the sun for a couple of days to dry out with that lacquer. And then I... Did you find you have to do... Did you find you had to do more pronounced detail in the sculpts? Yes. To, yes. to compensate okay you need to you need to you need to I, I honestly think you need to beef it up a bit to compensate and also 
to accommodate the shrinkage with Pro Bondo and mm -hmm. DTM because it shrinks a little bit. Yeah. Um, so sometimes even increase that. And I, what I did in the past, and this is the beauty of digital, was I printed molds, I ran a set, they weren't beefy enough. So I just went into ZBrush and stretched it and made it more severe without having to re-sculpt the whole thing, printed another one, and then, you know, tried again. It was like, oh, a little bit more. So I had to do it like two or three times to get exactly what I wanted, but I didn't have to sculpt the thing again, you know? So, Got it. And that, that was kind of cool. And I know this I am, is going to do everything, but it's, I'm, I'm pleased with the results. The more I use ZBrush, the more I love it. Well, it's nice to be able to print, isn't it? And now it puts yeah. it into a physical object that you can actually use uh but yeah so i sprayed it with the lacquer i put it in the sun for a couple of days to dry out and also really cure it with the uv light mm -hmm. and then um i i airbrushed several coats thin coats of um uh, inhibit x on there and then i sprayed it with epoxy par film as a release so the sealer kind of you know seals it yeah and inhibit x actively adds platinum to the surface to prevent or certainly reduce inhibition. And then over the top of that, the um, the epoxy par film, I use the price Driscoll, you know, Ultra yep. 4, uh, which now comes in the red cans. Mm -hmm. um, I gave that a couple of light coats. And then I found that worked just fine with 7315, which is a Polytech silicon, platinum silicon. So it takes a good four hours to cure. So there's plenty of time for inhibition to play. Had no problems. Right. So, so that's good. Well, Otherwise, that's you could just mold it in a, in a, in a different silicon. You could mold it in a, you know, tin. A, a tin silicon and, and that would work fine. Pull the resin out from that and then um, make a, a, a duplicate of that. Well, it's on my agenda as, well, as soon as I get back to Colorado. Excellent. Sweet. Mm. So yeah, we, um, we did cover um, uh, cutting edges on, on episode number 61, um, which is on our website, battlesofbitsrobot.com forward slash 61 cutting edges. The link will be in the show notes. Uh, but this, I really wanted to talk specifically about cutting edges on flat molds because I've seen people who've done it and I've noticed that they've sort of put the cutting edge like an inch away from the edge of the sculpt. Yeah. Which isn't, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that I think it's better if it's closer. And I have what I consider to be a reasonable argument for that, yeah. which is really nerdy. I know. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's also... Um presuming that there is flashing around the sculpture because uh, you don't always need to put flashing around it on, for a flat mold. No, that's true. I'm talking about here I, where I, yeah, when you're, here. when you're doing it, when you're doing encapsulated silicone, I think it's really important to, to have the flashing yeah. uh, and a good cutting edge. So you can use the flashing essentially as a handle for placement to prevent the, the cap plastic edges from, accidentally folding over on itself and and sticking which it will do if if you've lost the flashing and if you tr the harder you try not to let it flip over the more likely it is that it's going to yeah, well. yeah, yeah yeah hey that's one thing i like about doing my flat molds in zbrush is that you can put your wall exactly where you want it very close mm -hmm. on the cutting edge and then you know extrude it up to make the actual wall to retain the silicone yeah um, you don't get any excess because it's exactly the right place. It's just, when you've done it manually for 20 odd years, it's really nice <laughs> to have that option to get that precision. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so basically, yeah, uh, I, like I say, if you look at the pictures in the, uh, the video in the show notes, you'll see, but yeah, people put a cutting edge. Now my preferred way of doing it, and this is just me, I like to, when I'm dealing with silicon molds that are going to produce silicon appliances, I typically, if I'm going to use a cutting edge, I, typically go two or three millimeters away from the edge of the sculpt that's where my mm -hmm. cutting edge will begin and the reason i do it that close is because when you run your silicon appliance and it's a silicon mold you scrape the back the silicon will compress just a little bit which means your 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 flange you know your cutting edge area will be wider as a result so i start with it a little bit too close to begin with so that when the excess is scraped off that it's the right amount. And that's something I showed the students this week is how you can press down and actually be removing material from the negative without portion of the prosthetic to, yeah. without meaning to. Yeah. And then when you let it go, it just, it's just, like, hmm, I'm yeah. seeing texture with no material on it. 
Now, I would argue that you might think, well, what's the problem with having, you know, a wide margin of cat plastic around the edge of your piece? There's nothing wrong with that. And there isn't, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, missing a toe either but you know it, it's not optimal <laughs> so if, 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 you, if you don't have to lose that toe um then it's a good thing so it's the same so basically my, i would say that when pieces move if you have like a perimeter, you know a centimeter perimeter i would say perimeter, which doesn't make sense a perimeter of a centimeter or you know just under a court perimeter a cerimeter, a half an inch. If you've got a big wide margin of cat plastic, so you've got your silicon stops and then the cat plastic goes on for another half inch or so, then when the face moves, it crinkles and you get this weird margin of skin compressing weirdly in, in the same way that, um, you know, stretch and stipple does, which doesn't need to be there. So you're going to, so you could clean it off. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to clean it off, why is it there in the first place? because now you've made your mold bigger to accommodate this cutting edge that you're going to cut away. So it seems pointless to me. So um, I am of the opinion that a cutting edge that's very close is, 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 is better. I'm with you on that. Uh, and in the video, you know, that you, you'll see that because um, the, the easiest way to do any of this is to show you. And the other thing that, that matters is the softness of the silicon, because if you yeah. make your flat molds out of a very soft silicon, then when you press down with your scraper and scrape, it will compress more readily than a firmer silicon. And barely touching a soft silicone is going to depress it. Uh, yes. you know, I think a minimum of a 30 shore yeah. is what you need. I, ideally, I'd, I'd like to have a 40 or a 45 yeah, well, that's assuming you're running silicon pieces in it. If you're using Pro Correct. or PTM, yeah. you can go for your life. But I think the other thing is as well that, um, you know, you don't have to press hard. You could press gently, but then you'll you'll spend more time trying to get that clean edge. When you've got a 30 or 40 shore silicon mold, you can press very firmly and in one go, in one swipe, get a perfectly clean edge. Yeah, you don't better. have to go in with a Q-tip or do exactly. any, any, Which, any cleanup you know, on it. Yeah, which can disturb the, you know, the in, in the video, actually, you can see me cleaning the edge with a Q-tip and I kind of displace the cat plastic a bit because I'm a little bit heavy handed with it. So and if you've got one mold, that's fine. But if you've got 50 molds, you know, if it's taken you two or three minutes to scrape each one, that's a, you, won't, you won't have the time for silicon sets. So it just becomes much more practical to be doing things in such a way, I think, that you cleanly scrape it in one go and it's done. Right. And a caveat. If you're doing stone flat molds, don't you? If you're doing um, Pro Bondo, you know the the TPA or you know the PTM in a stone mold, mm -hmm. you have to encapsulate it, or you'll never get it out of the mold. Yeah, I can imagine that would be a, a pain. With or or, or it will be a real pain, as you as you just said, yeah. because because you're trying to get something frozen out of a, a rigid mold right right uh, so on, if it's encapsulated you can just let it thaw i mean matthew mungle does does his uh transfers with uh his his oh, his sealer his sealer. super soft sealer in it yeah, his super soft sealer and, is, is and then just lets it air lets it air dry and just peels it out of the mold so that will work whether you've got a silicone mold or a stone mold yeah because he doesn't even bother to freeze it. He just lets it, lets it dry and it's, they're, they're wonderful. And his sealer is freaking amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, especially that super soft one. Yeah, the, so you've um, just got to be careful. Know what material you, you need to make your pieces out of before you just blindly decide, oh, I'm going to do a stone mold or I'm going to do a silicone mold or I'm going to mm. whatever. And I, I do appreciate that um, this may sound like you're sort of splitting hairs, but it it, it does matter. I mean, it, it's, you know, sometimes really, really good work is the combination of, of 20 tiny little things. Mm -hmm. But when you habitually concern yourself with those things in advance and look out for them and make those extra steps you know that that's that's what good work is that's where it kind of comes from is you know looking at what you've done appraising it honestly and going this isn't right i don't like this why don't i like it what what, what is the reason for that and what can i do to mitigate it and well and that's because as as you know and I, I again this i have so many things that i that i say repeatedly to students is there are probably a half dozen ways to do everything that we do yeah 
how you do it is not as important as why you do it mm -hmm. a certain way. Mm -hmm. Why a silicone mold instead of a stone mold is going to depend on a number of factors. So you've got to give everything consideration before you jump into it, or you will find yourself behind the eight ball, uh, out of time, out of money, out of materials, and you still have to deliver because that date has not changed. Yeah, true enough. Yeah, when you said about stone molds, um, that's an interesting one because stone molds, are, I don't personally make a lot of stone molds, but they are incredibly inexpensive, um, mm -hmm. very quick. Um, my I just, I, I don't is, usually do it myself, but I wanted to show oh, this no, class absolutely. the the difference between between the two and why it's important to make these considerations of what you're going to be making in it. Yes, is yeah, absolutely really important. Absolutely, because the thing is, um, like you say, it's, it's why you do certain things the way you do them, and I think it's really good, especially in a learning environment like this, to do something that perhaps you could conceivably conceivably do but it is not a good idea necessarily to do so that you can show them why it's not a good idea like because the thing is with a with a plaster mold it is cheaper and it seems on paper to just be you know uh, the, the same thing but mm. then you know the amount of effort you'll have to go to to sort of seal it and release it and make sure it doesn't stick um and i know people will be listening to this going well i've done it it's fine i'm like that's good probably because you've been fastidious about how you've done it but if a hundred people do it, one or two people are going to be really slack and maybe not put as much release on, or they're a bit sloppy with it. And then they get stuck. Whereas you do it in a silicon mold, it comes out every time because it's silicon. So, um, you know, so that, so what, what, what you save in money, you make up for in the fact that you have to really pay attention and, and use a lot of release. And if you're running a piece 10 times, you know, the amount of release you use each time might, you know, might be a can of, par film you know that might make up the cost of the silicon which wouldn't need as much release and actually you think actually, right. it's cheaper to do that but having said that you know sometimes master molds certainly master molds of flat molds can be done in plaster um i found them to be more successful than resins because they don't they don't warp as much yeah and, and and they're cheaper they're much cheaper much much cheaper so yeah they're heavier but yeah i think most of my the master molds for my uh silicone flat molds are all ultra cal yeah they're heavier like you say and if you drop them you know well i guess unless you make it with burlap if you drop them they'll, they could crack or break if you drop a silicon mold it just bounces around and you look like you're chasing a chicken trying to pick it up <laughs> you know but but it doesn't break so but if they do break then you just get to improve your sculpting skills because you didn't like the way it looked in the, in, to begin with and you know you could do a better job exactly but yeah it's an interesting might be a make, make a good video to do an, a comparison of a flat mold and plaster and a flat mold in two or three different silicons and drop them and show it well, in slow and show thing. it in slow motion yeah there you go <laughs> you drop it as a as a, as a kind of uh slow motion um, video and the annoying thing that would get more views than the actual stuff about how to make a good mold <laughs> put it in a blender <laughs> people love a blender yeah blender thing mm. Spe I could, speaking of which, I don't know if we've ever mentioned this before, but if you've got, you know, little chunks of silicone from an old mold, you know, that you've cut something up to throw it away because you don't want, you know, something proprietary or, or getting into the hands of, of somebody, hang on to these chunks of silicone because you can use that stuff as filler uh, in, in some kind of molds when you're pouring it in there. If you don't have a whole lot of material, you can take these chunks of already cured silicone to make up for volume when you're when you're making molds, like brush-ons and stuff. Certainly, yeah, yeah. yeah provided that you know it's, it's those chunks aren't going to adversely affect the surface of the sculpture. Yeah, still uh, do your brush where, where you need the detail, but you can certainly use that to take up volume. Yeah, good call. I've not done that before. I guess you can need a quite powerful blender and maybe you don't do too mm -hmm. much at once bit of time, but yeah, it's one of those materials that frustratingly isn't reusable otherwise, but that would make an excellent uh, way of, of using up our walls. I guess clean them first with IPA. It's yeah. Not come yeah. in shite and then yeah, blitz the crap out of them and then use it as a, as a thickening agent 
for your silicon. That's a good idea. Yeah, I've I've used oh. chunks of styrofoam. I've used old silicone. It's not something I do a, a lot, but I have done it, and it mm. works great. I have done it. I think it was an, another of Neil's suggestions. I think it was for round the backs of ears and noses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. brush-ons because then it keeps its shape but then it means that when you pull something out you know that that foam compresses more readily around those those tricky undercut areas but ostensibly they are held in the correct place when it's in a neutral position which is quite useful um so yes so yeah I'll, I'll i'll put that um that video up with with all the pictures and hopefully that will make some sense to you but i'll be interested to hear what people think uh, but yeah, it was just one of the things where I consistently have seen a lot of, you know, flashing a long way away from the edge of the sculpt. I'm like, it's like people have seen that cutting edges are there, but they're not quite sure why they're there or where exactly they should be. And I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be that close and it doesn't have to follow the sculpt exactly. But it's something that I saw Daniel Parker do and he was very, very fussy about how he wanted his cutting edges done. I did some molds for a commercial crash. We're going back 25 years, but it stayed with me, you know, that kind of very careful you know, mm -hmm. edges, right, mimic, like follow the, sh you know, hug the sculpt. So it's like a coastline, yeah. form, you know, but, yeah, you want it to be consistent. You don't want it to be, you know, three millimeters here and 10 millimeters somewhere else try yeah. to I mean, we've all been try to main, try to maintain <laughs> this the same distance all the way yeah. around if yeah. you can we've all been in a hurry you know it's like it's like getting dressed in the dark it's like it's not again it's not optimal you do it if you have to but um you know maybe if you're going out for a night out take a little bit of time on your appearance and the same with the molds you know if you want it to be good and you know maybe people you want to work with again will see it you know no bad thing if you spend an extra 20 minutes making it nice zachary uh so there we go so that was cool um yeah so like i said i'll put that video uh it's out, it's on the channel now but i've just had it on private because i didn't want lots of people i've sent you the link but i wanted i didn't want anyone to watch it until this episode mm -hmm. had come out but it's taken a while to get to it because it's been rather yeah busy. we've been wanting we've been wanting to do episode 75 for almost a month yeah it's taken maybe that long maybe even it. longer yeah, it's kind of funny because people go, oh, you know, when you're doing podcasts, like when I started this job and people are asking about, you know, when's the next one coming out and how often do you do them? And I'm like, well, it does take a while to do them because, you know, like for this, this throwaway, you know, 20 minute conversation about cutting edges, I know we waffled on that other stuff, but that's the nature of this stuff. You know, there's things crop up and it's good to talk about what's, what's happening now, but, um, uh, you know, I've got to make the video. So I had to shoot some stuff and then edit it and then do the voiceover and then you know cut it together and then write the description and upload it to youtube and all that takes you know adds up to about a day's work because i'm not a videographer i mean then it's not shit but it's not what i do all the time so i'm not that efficient with it and then you know then we want to have this conversation and then we want to mm -hmm. you know put the whole thing together and then present it in the next few days hopefully i'll get this out um so it takes a little time to do so that's why they're a little bit, you know, few and far between. And I've had people say like, oh, how much money did you make from the podcast? I'm like, dude, have you heard any adverts on this podcast? None. <laughs> you don't and, make money having a podcast. You do if you're Joe Rogan. But this and is aside from <laughs> doing it on Zoom, the other software, SoundForge and, and uh, Vegas, they ain't cheap. No, I mean, I you know, I have the, my Adobe CC subscription every month, and but you know, that's not yeah. just for the podcast, but it's just, it's you know, but, but what what is for the podcast is the cost of you know hosting. I have to you have to pay for hosting, which if you if YouTube videos are free, is usually a surprise to people that audio is not free. But there's very good reasons for that. Um, one of which is I own the fucking content. I don't. It, it's not at the whim of whether or not YouTube want to take stuff up. So you know, We're, we will not refuse donations. No, but I'm just saying it's one of those things where it's funny when people say, oh, you know, and I'm like, no, it, you know, <laughs> I mean, there are people that make money out of podcasting, but those are very, very popular, um, you know, uh, yeah, so it takes a while. So, we, you know, we're doing what we can, but um, I, I certainly think with the, with this job, like I said, and I'm quite serious that I have a lot of time to think about stuff quite intensely. So we'll be doing more of these while I'm working because uh, it might take a while to get us to record. Uh, usually on a Saturday evening, but we will get it done. Yeah, well, you sent me a couple of interesting posts that you had seen on uh, Neil's uh, 911 
page on Facebook, which I don't, I don't get to see anymore since I have Sent said bye bye to Facebook. <laughs> yeah, um, you do see some interesting posts. <laughs> some of some some, some uh, could be just Google searches, <laughs> um, which is you know always amusing but um mm-hmm. but yeah it's 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 interesting when you see something or someone asks you a question about something that, that genuinely sparks up uh, and sometimes it's an interesting thing that you weren't even looking for and someone you know points you at something and it takes you on a little journey that you weren't expecting and you go wow well, you know and i love that when that happens i've been reading a book when we moved to where we did move i think i told you there's a few books there was a guy that was like a, a wheelwright that used to make wheels for carts back in yes you know, yeah early i remember period and um he wrote a couple of books and he wrote several books that were not about wheelwright stuff uh it was just to do with crafts and stuff and it's fascinating reading about basically laboring and the working class laborers in early victorian period and how things changed how the land use changed and all that kind of stuff. And this guy was talking about uh, that he had had a message. He was, this particular book was about a carpenter and it's his life as a carpenter and about how they, how they buy their wood, how they transport the wood, which is actually more interesting than it sounds because this is before motor cars. And, mm-hmm. you know, so how do you, how do you get, you know, heavy trees and stuff? And then you've got to saw them into planks and you've got to decide which wood is for what, because certain woods and you cut it when it's green and then it's going to warp when it seasons and all this stuff's fascinating. Anyway, he mentioned in this thing that he had an order and the order came through in the form of a, uh, a stereotype message. So I looked up stereotype message and I didn't know what a stereotype was. I know we use it in terms of, of like, you know, uh, you know, take the piss out of somebody by you know, cliching, but both the word cliche and stereotype are printing terms. Um, and uh, I had no idea this was a thing. And basically when you make, a, 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 you know, set up a, a, a page for ty- of type, you have your letters in reverse and you line them up and then you put lending in there and everything. And there's words for all these things and I can't remember what they are, but you basically arrange, you know, a printed page of a newspaper or a, or a, a book or whatever. And then you, you print whatever you're going to print. So maybe you do a run of 2000 copies of something and then you sell that book and then you want those letters back because you're going to use them for something else. And those were all hand carved all hand cards right, yeah. initially so you've got all this stuff done and then what happens is the book is really popular and they want another two thousand books but of course you've dismantled that page you don't have it anymore so you end up spending time getting typesetters in to set the type that's what a typesetter was um so what they used to do was they would they would do a a, a set of type up as a printing thing and they would actually make a mold of that so that they could reproduce that sheet with the with the with the type and everything and the images as a physical object, almost like a raised three D print, but it's mm-hmm. obviously in the mold. It's the correct way around, and a lot of the molds they were using were paper mache, and there exists these molds. You can still see them. Uh, I can't remember the name of this thing, but if you look it up, it's amazing. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Is there a museum somewhere? There are museums. Yeah, there are printing museums. But it, it was amazing to me that this was a thing that, that people actually made molds of these things. And obviously because you duplicated it, that became a, a stereo of the typeface, hence stereotype. And it was just like, you know, and then you would run into this uh, and a rigid copy, usually in metal of that sheet with all the fonts in it without you having to reset the type. Um, and obviously depending on how many pages are in your printed page, obviously each piece of paper in a printed book has uh, eight sides because obviously there's the front and back and then it's got a, a, a crease down the middle where yeah. the fixing would be so you'd have the front and back of one side and the front and back of the other so you've got like four different and the spine and, uh... and the spine is amazing and it was just like holy shit so you would actually print and and make up a mold of this set of type and it was just a, another example of where molds have been used and I was completely ignorant of all of this. I mean, some people would give going, well, yeah, we all knew that at school. Yeah, I don't I care. Heard of it. Tell, talk about something interesting, Stuart. Oh, my God. I was amazed by it. And you Put the name of the book things. up on the, uh, with the show notes because I, as, as well as I'm sure others, will love to uh, <laughs> increase their brain power. 
Yeah, well, I'd, I'd, I'd love to learn more about that. Okay. Well, I'll tell you one that's, of the good cool things shit. as well is the um, there's a there's a uh, 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 if you've heard you've heard of the Gutenberg Press org, which is basically a uh, the Gutenberg Press is the original kind of printing press mm-hmm. uh, invented by the uh, Gutenberg like- Bible is what people may may have have heard that term before. It's yes, the well, first I- example of a printing press printing a book. Unfortunately, the only Gutenberg I'd ever heard of was Steve Gutenberg from the Police Academy movies, but he had nothing to do with. <laughs> and which is going to be nothing. Don't forget that under the age of thirty-five. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there's a the, so the Gutenberg Press was obviously the name of the original printing press, and then um, the uh, there's there's the Gutenberg org is all the Gutenberg project. I think is org is basically an online repository of free books that are now out of copyright. So there are a lot of books that you can buy that are legally out of copyright. So they can be distributed freely because the, the, the copyright holders no longer are alive or that time has passed. And um, some of the books that I've bought on my Kindle, I've since found out are actually um, free. You can get them on the Gutenberg press. So I'll, I'll try and link them on there, but there's, there's loads of um, Victorian um, uh, sort of craft type memoirs which are really interesting because they explain you know how they did stuff in great detail and, and it's a dwindling source and i find a lot of that especially with things like mold making and stuff you know how many people used to do this all the time because that's how i'm, I'm fascinated stuff. by by that kind of craftsmanship of how they do things in fact i just had a brief conversation with rob freitas last week because he had posted an image on on instagram of a stone mold. Um, I think it was one that he had done way back, way back when, uh, but beautiful. And just, just the way he'd photographed this, this mold. I said, this needs to be in a museum. And it's mm-hmm. part, there needs to be a mold museum because there are all kinds of molds and this stuff goes back millennia. Yeah. And they use it in so many different ways. Um, you know, when we had Rob on the podcast, I don't know if you remember, but um, I brought with him, um, I brought with me to show him um, a Bronze Age axe head that my dad had mm-hmm. found years ago when I was a kid. Um, and there's nothing special about it. It's it's just a Bronze Age axe head. And, you know, certain parts of the country, you can't fucking move for f- coming across all kinds of old stuff. But what was fascinating for it to me was the fact there was a seam line in it because it came from a mold, you know, someone had carved this shape in reverse into, you know, two pieces of stone and then put them together and then filled it with, you know, molten bronze and then worked this edge into a a workable edge. But the seam line was still visible. And it was a really nice thing that this was a few thousand years old. And I wanted to, to sort of say, look, you know, this is, we still have that problem now <laughs> with seam lines, even with prints. We're worried yeah. about, you know, the, the printing lines and, and, and we take great steps to, to not have them as visible lines because of the way they're built. Um, and it's an inescapable truth, you know, the, the limitations of things. And um, so, yeah, the huge amount of work that goes around dealing with those things and, uh, and stuff, it's, it's fascinating. Anyway, I, I realize this is phenomenally nerdy, but I'm guessing if you're listening to this kind of shit, this is the sort of stuff you like anyway. So it kind of pre-qualifies itself. Um, we're not interested in trying to pull people in who are not interested in this stuff because, yeah. you know, there's, there's plenty of that out there. That's not what this is. Um, but uh, yeah. You know, it's not always about battles with bits of rubber. It's always, it can, can sometimes be about, battles with bits of something else Stone. Stone. well yeah i mean that would have just made a very long title though it's, it's, it's a long enough title as it is but uh, yeah all of these things because obviously you if you make a mold you've got to get the mold off of something and then you're hoping to get something out of that mold later so um yeah that could come into it but obviously with regards to those kinds of things you know you didn't have a lot of these rubbers that we have now for molding yeah so, well the 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 shrek ear that i was telling you that i'm that i'm molding to show the class how to do we are going to face some challenges like that with a couple of the makeups uh the students are are doing that have got intricate fronts and backs that will possibly require more than one piece to get it <clears throat> 
get it molded off of, <clears throat> excuse me, the the positive that it was sculpted on. Right, right, right. Is so that a bottle of I will keep I, behind you. Oh, right here? No, that's yeah, uh, that's water. That's that's water. But I do have a okay. bottle of Perry and Spirit right here. There we go. Hold those two up together. That is a shockingly similar. <laughs> yeah. No. That, yes, yeah. Holy crap! You don't want to get a no. screen grab. <laughs> Is you don't want to oh. grab one and take a take a swig out of that. That is very funny. Yikes! Uh, that's very funny. Yeah, you'll have to take a photo of that. I don't know how to do the screen grab in Zoom. I'm looking. I don't know how to do it. I well, do though it. I think the video is recording automatically, so I'll be able to get a screen grab later. But maybe if you take a photo of them next to each other, you can. <laughs> but yeah, you. My brushes are not washing out all yeah. shitty, and yeah. and now I feel kind of weird. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I genuinely thought that was power and spirit because I couldn't read the words. I could see there was white, uh, white black, white. black background and white letters. Yeah, that's all I could see. Anyway, danger. Excellent stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you want to tell us off and tell us how boring we are, you can always uh, get in touch with the show, uh, Stuart and Todd at gmail.com. The and is the word and, it's not an ampersand. It's just the word Stuart and Todd at gmail.com. Yeah. And we haven't been told off in quite some time. So, yeah. It's maybe nice it's maybe it's high time. Uh, so, yeah. And check us out and obviously on Instagram as well. But, uh, or you can leave us a voice message on our website, which is battleswithitsrubber.com. And, uh, yeah. Be good to hear from you. Thank you, Todd your time Stu, it's it's I, you know we've chatted a little bit uh since our last podcast but it's nice to be able to get on the record again i miss you dude oh man well we must catch up it's my turn to come come over your way well there is that so you know you know where we are all right dude <laughs> i will talk to you soon i'll probably at least once this week okay man Take all care. right See you later, later. You can get in touch through our Facebook page or email us at stuartandtodd at gmail.com. Check the show notes for more information. If you enjoyed this episode, tell someone else and help us grow by sharing it on social media. Thanks for listening.